increase the efficiency of our production, but we've got all kinds of challenges facing us. Movement, land, water, people, labor, everything. How are we going to produce that price? It's a major, major challenge for us. And that's just to say where we are, but we know that where we are isn't good enough. There's too much malnutrition in the world. We know that there are many clay parts in the world where the production practices are terrible, they're damaging to the environment. So the current situation is not acceptable. Not to mention the stresses that are being put on it by the demands for the future. And the yield growth rates are nowhere near high enough. So we've got a heck of a challenge in front of us as an agricultural research institution. And the one I want to remind you that the world is expecting to come up with the solutions. Think about it. Is the world thinking, expecting Syngenta to come up with the solution? No. Are they expecting a university? No. They're going to go back to where you guys solved the problem last time around. What you got for us this year? Which way to think about it's a pretty good position to be in. At least you got a little sleep overnight, that's something to lose sleep over. So I tell our donors, you guys, we need a second green revolution. And this one is going to have to be even more scientifically rich than the first one. And now I'm happy to tell them that the second green revolution, by the way, in case you haven't noticed, is already underway. And when I say science-based, the question comes up, what do you mean, science-based? You know, in some parts of the world, science is almost becoming a dirty word. Science, Ooh. that means you're anti-nature. We have before us a tremendous transformation taking place in our understanding biology of living things. Is there a biology of dead things? I don't know. Is that a, trend, a revolution in understanding of biology and genetics and what that means for transforming our crops. An understanding that there is a biology of the soil that can determine the sustainability of our production system. We have a revolution in computational capacity, data management, communications, remote sensing, all of which allow us to answer and ask questions that previously were just wild speculation. We're able to address complexity in a way that we never thought we'd be able to, at least I never thought we'd be able to do in, in, in my lifetime. And I also believe that we have the opportunity to get into the politicians, the policy makers, Politicians, people who formulate policy and get them to understand that what is needed to feed their people, what is needed for stability, economic growth, and how we can provide that scientifically. And it's up to us to make sure that message gets across. Nobody else has the information that allows that message to get out. If we don't get it out, we can't be surprised if it doesn't get out. Now, we're not all very good communicators. The vast majority of us are hopeless geeks. But we need to be able to link with people who are good communicators so the policymakers can understand the opportunities that are there. One of the great opportunities is the genetic resources. Relatively small amount, only 5% estimated, has been used in our breeding program. But that revolution in molecular biology, computational power, etc., is changing all of that. We have, uh, last year, completed the sequence of 3,000 of rice, uh, rice genomes. I mean, that's a phenomenal undertaking. And we have developed a very sophisticated pipeline for analyzing the genetic resources, using those to address the major challenges that are, that are facing us. Putting together the pieces that previously were, were not there for, for assembly. 2002, just before I joined Erie, the first rice 
genome were sequenced. Front page of Science Magazine. Front page. We did 3,000. And I called up my friend who's a correspondent. I said, hey, we got this. I said, ah, yeah. But we have uh, just an enormous contribution. All that's publicly available. And it was a team effort. I talked about partnership when we started. Chinese scientists, theory scientists, scientists from around the world contributing to make this dream of sequencing the rice gene bank possible. And that is a, and it's a pretty fair amount of data that we put together. We, we, I didn't have nothing to do with it, but we put together. That's the, uh, who was it, Mark Twain said, the only people who can say we are newspaper editors, the Pope, and people with tapeworms. <laughs> but um, at any rate, uh, 17 trillion, 22 billion, 1 million, 694,246 data points for 3,000 genomes. I just think it's, it's pretty amazing. And, and, and uh, I just love this slide. Can you think about if you're typing that? at three nucleotides or three letters of the sequence a second, which is basically one DNA word, which is one, 20 words a second, which is about my typing speed. It would take you 170,000 years to type that 3,000 sequences. Enormous computational challenge. But here's uh, partnerships around, around the world and put together, put that data on the World Wide Web. It's available, it's on the cloud, Amazon Cloud, so that anybody in the world who wants to access that data and use it, and signs the appropriate FTA, can use it. Now, what, uh, this is one of the, you know, there's a, I got a list about this long of things that drive me crazy. Somewhere on the list is, we can't do anything right. We were encouraged within the CGIR system to sign an open access agreement and have all the data and everything we produce is open to the public. Okay, fine, that's not a problem. So we have this open access policy and then all this data goes out on the web and it's public. And now people's heads are exploding because, oh, you made all that data available so the private multinationals can go and create products and then sell them. Okay, well, then you don't want us to make it available. Oh, no, you have to make it available. Okay, I get it. Well, actually, I don't any of you who do get it, if you could explain it to me tomorrow at the party, I'll appreciate it. The point is that it is available out there, and we've made that available. But sequence by itself is pretty much, unless you're an evolutionary biology, biologist, sequence itself is not all that useful. You need to understand how that relates to plant performance, and we've made huge investments in putting the facilities together at Erie with our partners so that we can characterize the plants and we can understand their, their performance. And all of that leads us towards dealing with the challenges of climate change. All of the genetic information that we collect, the assessment of how plants perform, are absolutely essential for our dealing with climate change. Increasing temperatures, changing rainfall patterns, sea level rise, intense storms, all require different kinds of rice plants that can withstand it. We're the people who can develop them. So we're in the process of making our rice climate ready. The beauty of this, and I, I used to call it the con convenient convergence, is that the same problems that were challenging poor rice farmers today, droughts and floods, are the same problems that will be challenging the world in the future of changing climate, droughts and floods. And I thought it was a convenient convergence that we could work on problems that were critical to today's, to today's poor at the same time as we solve problems that will be facing the world because of challenge, uh, uh, changes in climate change in 20 years. Convenient convergence. Then Al Gore came out with his inconvenient truth and I had to stop using that. So. But I was using the book. 
that I'm holding up. Um, so, when we think about the challenges of climate change, storm surges, sea level rise, let's reflect on rice again. 20 or 50% of the increase in rice production in the last 25 years came from the Delta countries of Asia. And the deltas are, by definition, at sea level. Sea levels rise, you've got problems with flooding, you've got problems with civil You have to deal with those. And flooding is a major problem around the world. And back in the 1970s, I'll give you that little diagram, the tortuous development of someone rice, blood power and rice. We've been working on this since the 1970s. And in fact, in 2006, a paper was published in the journal Nature that described the fundamental physiology and genetics of flood tolerance. After multiple failures, we were able to sequence, we again, I, I love being a part of it, we were able to sequence the gene and put forth, put forth some hypotheses about how it worked and actually, at the same time, incorporate that into varieties that farmers would grow. The original sub-1, or the flood tolerant rices that we tried to develop, some of them tolerated floods pretty well, but they were essentially inedible. I was told once that they took a the sample of this to, to, to people and said, how does this flood tolerant rice look and taste? And they said, took one bite of it and said, this rice is so bad my dog wouldn't eat it. I'm not sure if that's an accurate quote. They might have said I wouldn't feed it to my dog. Uh, but either way, pretty lousy. But the, the, the point is that, one of the points is that the science that we had to do in order to create a sub, uh, flood tolerant platform of rice was pretty sophisticated. It was so sophisticated that it made it into the premier scientific journal in the world, nature. And in that paper, it was almost terrorist. Because in the same paper that reported the basic science, they talked about how you could take that finding and put it into varieties rapidly so farmers could benefit from it, the poorest of the poor. I think that will stand the test of time of being a landmark paper what science and research for development means. And you've seen this slide many times. I like to say, of course, that the plots with the yellow labels have the flood tolerant gene in them. The plots with the white labels don't have the, or the same varieties that don't have the gene in it. You don't need a statistician to tell you which one's better than the other. And that was great scientific work. I saw this field in my first year as director general. And when I went out with Dave Michelle, Abdel, and uh, Sadatu, I think, went out, looked at that field, and I looked, I said, man, did I pick the right job. You see that, and you say, this is transformational. If you know that the millions and tens and hundreds of millions of people who suffer from floods every year, we got something. This will make a big difference. And in 2008, we took it out to Farmer's Field. We, again, the editorial will be, don't have to take one. We took it out to Farmer's Fields in eastern India. This is, what the, this is what the field looked like after two floods. It looked terrible. It looked like this was, those were the flood tolerant varieties in the field. They were flapping, saying, plow it up, and then the earth. Friends, colleagues in India say, well, just give it a chance. These little green shoots there. So this farmer, Mr. Paul, listened to us. He didn't plow in that field, and this is what his field looked like in October. Complete recovery, a very decent yield, and um, that is moving like wildfire across South Asia. Bangladesh, India, Southeast, also in, in, in Indonesia, Philippines and, and Vietnam. And I tell our donors that the day that Mr. Paul did not plow in that field was 
the day the second Green Revolution started. These farmers were left behind by the first Green Revolution. They did not grow modern varieties because they would not yield, they'd be killed by the floods. And I think that's just a phenomenal story, but what's even more phenomenal is the work that our people did in looking at who was benefiting from this. And this paper came out in one of the nature family of journals, very critically reviewed, tough papers. And I, was, I received that last uh, year, but that early last year, as when I receive a scientific paper, I give it incredible attention. I read the abstract and then go right to the conclusions. I'm a busy man, a busy man. <laughs> and when I read that last paragraph, and it said, this study indicates that scheduled casts are likely to be major beneficiaries from the spread of this material. I literally got my hair and my arm stood up. I said, yeah, this really is. This is the real deal. This is doing it. And um, pretty exciting thing. We're bringing hope, changing lives. Bet. But it's not just floods, it's drought as well. Across Southeast Asia, South Asia, major problem. <laughs> and we've got drought tolerant varieties. And these have been in the works for a long time. When Gary Atlin was here, he was working on these. He was instrumental in developing a material called Sabagi Don, which is really going well in, in eastern India. I had uh, last year in, in visiting villages, but they were growing Sabagi Don. And they were ecstatic, over the moon about it. Because they, they had some drought, and then it was giving a decent yield. And we sat down and we ate it. And I thought it tasted like cardboard. Oh, terrible price. And then so I asked them sort of, what do you think about the, the quality? And they looked at me and they said, well, it's a lot better than nothing. Well, okay, you got a point. What's really exciting, though, is that because we understand the mechanisms of drought and flood tolerance, we can combine them. And we are now in the very late stages of the release, or preparing to release varieties that tolerate floods and they tolerate drought in the same variety. Because farmers, if you're living in a lousy environment, they add insult to injury when they hand it out that in those environments. Because you can get a flood in one in one season, and then the, later on in the same season, you'll get a drought. So now we've got materials. That, and we thought we talked to people in the late 80s, early 90s, we're going to get drought and flood tolerant in the same variety. They've talked to people, going to have you committed because you're a complete lunatic. Fact is, now because we understand better the genetics, heritability, physiology, we can do that. And that will be, again, another set of transformations. And a few weeks ago, I was in Odisha. Matthew mentioned I got an honorary degree there. I really wanted to go out and talk to farmers, which is my favorite. And I was talking with these women, and this, they had been growing the flood tolerant materials, and they were really excited about it. They got great yields. It turns out, paper that uh, the same group that, that did the earlier paper I talked about. These people are adding fertilizer, the crops are getting better yields, et cetera. I said, what are you doing with the extra money? What does this mean to you? They looked at me a little bit like that. It's kind of thick in the head, which I get used to being looked at like that. And they said, um, well, it goes to our household. I asked the men, I had, I had the men of the department, the women of the department, they used to ask me, I asked them each the same question. What are you doing with the extra money? And then for the men, I kind of winked and said, to, you know, have a drink a little bit. They looked at me with horror. They said, are you kidding? It goes to our household. It goes to our, our family, to our kids. I asked the same thing to the women. They said, well, it goes to the household. It goes to our children's school fees, clothes, books. And this then clicked with some of you went to Cavage Visa seminar, Andy Parker seminar, alias, on the loop surveys from the Philippines. And if you paid attention during that seminar, it turns out that the real beneficiaries of the adopters of the Green Revolution were not the farmers themselves, but it was their children. 
And that's what really hit me when I was talking with these ladies, that it's about the children. The farmers' lives are set. The adults' lives are set. It's their children's lives that will really change. And one of the women, the, the, the one on the, right in the middle of the frigid sari, she said to me also, it means the end of poverty. And here are these people living in unbelievable poverty. And she said, having a reliable harvest was the end of poverty. And so I asked, you know, what it meant? She says, well, it means that we'll always have enough rice for the whole year, so we won't be poor anymore. Another kind of indication of poverty is all about. And it was pretty moving, I have to tell you, to be know that I was small played a small small part in, in what from her perspective was an end of poverty. But again, poverty is not just about money, it's not just about calories or kilos of rice, it's what kind of rice we're getting. We have created rice that has high zinc content. I have iron content, I beta carotene and vitamin A. We know we can address these major scourges of But it has to get around the world. These rice materials have to get around the world. With our partners in GRISP, we have set up a network where genetic resources can move freely around across our partnerships. These are essential to having the kind of impact we want. But it's also not only about variety. I'm going to go over time, uh, but then again, we've got to go over time. Um, it's a very long introduction for Matt. It's his fault. <laughs> Those of you who can transport a PPS who want to go after your Mary end up, I hope you're in the doorway. Um, but at any rate, managing the crop, the essential part of, of, of transforming lives. And the problem we have is that farmers' fields differ. And the, the, the recipe in the past has been to have one solid recommendation for everybody. Everybody got, okay, you've got to put three splits of nitrogen, that many kilos, and that's it. <coughs> Spacing is the same, and irrigation patterns the same, but in actual fact, we know that that's not the way the world works. We just have to have the way, the tools, the means to understand how to provide recommendations that go in to individual farmers' fields. So for 25 years, we've been working across Asia primarily, trying to understand what were the parameters that drove optimum yield in a particular field. Now, let's, I hope you picked up a pattern here. Over the last 25 years, I don't think I've talked about any significant piece of impact that we've had it took less than 20 years. It's a long haul. But anyway, we came up with our, our scientists looking at what made the fields different in terms of their management requirements. Came up with really quite a set of sophisticated tools to allow them to make recommendations or develop tools that allowed farmers to make decisions that were suitable for their fields. Came up with all kinds of neat manuals and CDs and all this sort of thing that would help farmers make decisions. Took a, didn't actually get out to the farmers very well. It wasn't until we started to pay attention to the mobile applications. It occurred to some of our scientists that, hey, every farmer has a mobile phone. Maybe if we use the mobile phone as a means to interact with the farmer, we could get information out to them and they could make their decisions, providing the information for their farms and getting the recommendation for their farms. And that's the sort of thing that we've been doing. And it's actually going, it's a pretty exciting, pretty exciting set of technologies that a farmer who's sort of literate, but got, probably got a kid who knows, knows this stuff, how to use the phone and everything, quite sophisticated can actually interact with our systems that have 25 years of modeling, database management, systems work, and, a, and ask the question, how much fertilizer should I put on my crop when, and get an answer that the farmer could understand. And we're now working with our colleagues around the world, Africa Rice, colleagues
colleagues in South and Southeast Asia to adjust these tools so that they work for them. Phil Rice, Department of Agriculture and the Federal Reserve, critical in working out this technology so that it works. And it's been pretty exciting here because over the last, uh, uh, last year, we can see that we have hundreds of thousands of Philippine rice farmers who are actually using this tool. And because the number is going up from year to year, they're not abandoning it. Abandoning it. They're finding it worthwhile. And it's pretty exciting to be working with the Philippine government, Phil Rice Department of Agriculture here, taking this technology to the last mile so that the farmers actually adopt it. And it's going to be growing in sophistication. Crop manager, and then a whole advisory system. What I see happening is something that we did not predict when we started. And that is that an entire business model will be built around this. That there will be people working in the countryside who will provide services to farmers. It won't be individual farmers necessarily calling up the service, but there will be people providing packages that will allow farmers to get good information about their crops and their fields. So it's a pretty exciting time of events for crop management. People generally think about agronomy and crop management, except for a few select people in this room. It's pretty dull stuff, dull as dirt. But in fact, it's extraordinarily exciting. As a matter of fact, today's soil day. My wife, Kristen, reminded me of that as we were driving down Peel and Drive. I don't know how she knew it was going to be the soil day. And I said, where'd she get the dirt on that? And uh, it went down about as well with her as it did with, uh, with you guys. There is no sense of humor in this story. <laughs> but anyway, we see this, we see the whole crop management approach changing dramatically as the years go by. And I think it's the role of an institution like here to think the global level. And we've been bringing together, along with UNEP, large companies in the private sector, national, key national systems around the world, to create a sustainable rice platform that will, in fact, provide the means to systematically, over very large areas, reduce the agronomic footprint of rice production. Greenhouse gas emissions, fertilizer runoff, pesticide misuse, et cetera, while increasing rice production. And we know this is possible. And it's going to require new kinds of partnerships, not just the area with the national systems, but a pretty significant investment of very large companies we see it in their financial interest to make it happen. There's a lot of changes in mindset. In case you haven't noticed, over the last decade or so, a lot of our thinking has had to change to adapt to the new world. And this is just one example. And it's really important that as we have these technologies, that we communicate to our policy makers, that we make sure that they have the information that they need to make decisions. They need to understand if they invest in certain technologies, how will rice production change? How will rice supplies change? They also need to understand in any given year what their production situation is. They, they just, you know, look, they gotta know how much area is harvested, what we expect the yield to be, what they expect the production. A minister, the problem we have today is, Minister of Agriculture says, we're going to have to increase our production by 25 million, or 25, uh, uh, thousand tons per district uh, in the next year in order to meet our food security needs. And everybody says, yes, sir. And uh, time comes time to report the, uh, the yield data, production data.